Welcome to Understanding Islam, Standing Before God, Episode 5. The Hajj, the pilgrimage that unites all Muslims worldwide. Imagine the assembly of people every year at Mecca, from every language and culture, men and women, different ages, around three and a half million people every year. That's the Hajj. This annual pilgrimage binds everybody together as human beings, nothing more and nothing less. The way that this is demonstrated in the Hajj tradition is that everybody wears special clothes. These clothes are called ikhram. For a man, this comprises of two sheets of unsewn white cloth, one wrapped around the lower body and one wrapped around the, other, the upper body. For a woman, this cloth is made into a plain, simple tunic dress. No ornaments, no jewellery. Now you see, what we've done by putting on ikhram is to elevate everybody to their human dignity. All the signs of how rich you are, how educated you are, what is your status in life, are all removed. Everybody now is elevated to the dignity of being a human being. In the 1960s, Malcolm X, the African-American civil rights activist, who was coming from an extreme group within Islam that spoke of black supremacy. Malcolm X came to do the Hajj, and he experienced there for the first time the absolute oneness of humankind. People ate together, they slept together in the same tents, they all performed the same rituals. So the first lesson of Hajj is that all humankind are united together, all humankind are one. The rites of the Hajj go back long before the time of Prophet Muhammad. They go back to the time of Abraham, and his second wife, Hagar, and their son, Ishmael. Now, both in the biblical tradition and in Islam, we know that Abraham had two wives. First, he had Sarah, but they grew old together, childless. And then he took a second wife, who was an Egyptian, and she was called Hagar. Now, Abraham and Hagar together produced Ishmael. And after Sarah had also had a child, Isaac, a message came from God to allow Hagar and Ishmael to go out from Hebron, from Palestine, to the place to which God would direct them. According to Islamic tradition, that place was Mecca. And so, Hagar and Ishmael journeyed together down to Mecca. When they got there, there was a shortage of water. They had nothing to drink. And so Hagar left Ishmael and went in search of water. Now she did what you do in the desert when you're looking for water. She climbed to a small hill and scanned the horizon for any sign that there could be water to be found. When she couldn't find any, she ran to another hill, and then backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards between the two, seeking the mercy and providence of God that they would find water. God inspired Ishmael to dig his heels into the ground, and a spring of water came up in that place. That spring flows to this day. It's called the spring of Zamzam and today it's incorporated into the sacred mosque in the middle of Mecca. Another incident is recorded later on when Ishmael had grown into a strong youth and Abraham came to visit this part of his family and together 
Abraham and Ishmael built a building for the worship of God, a simple cuboid building called the Kaaba. God contributed to the building of this Kaaba by sending a stone from paradise that was built into one corner. It is called the Black Stone. And after they had finished building the Kaaba, which according to tradition is built on a site on which Adam and Eve had built the first building on earth for the worship of God, after they had finished, they then went around and around the Kaaba singing the praises of God. This is called Tawaf. Another incident is recorded, and that is Abraham and Ishmael being put to the test by God. Both in the biblical tradition and in the Quran, we hear of this episode. In the Quran, the sun is not mentioned, but according to Islamic understanding, this is Ismail, because he existed as the sun before Isaac was born. Another important difference in the Quranic story is that both Abraham and Ishmael are put to the test. Ishmael knows what's happening. Indeed, Abraham goes to him and says, God has commanded me to sacrifice you. What do you think? And Ishmael replies, you will find in me an obedient servant. Who am I to tell God when I should die? So of the two of them go out to the place where the sacrifice is to take place, and they both prostrate before God in total submission and obedience. Ismail remains on the ground, waiting for his father to kill him at God's command. And as Abraham is about to do the act, he is stopped and instead an animal is provided that they should sacrifice instead. Now, all these events link together the Abrahamic family of faiths. Indeed, the place of Mecca is associated with the place where Adam and Eve were reconciled to God after they were cast out of the garden. And so we can see that it is a place that unites the whole of humankind all the way back to Adam and Eve. The Hajj only takes place once a year on five days during the month of Dhul-Hajjah. It is an obligatory act for every Muslim man and woman once in their lives, provided that they have sufficient wealth and health to perform it. Health because the activities of the Hajj are quite strenuous in a climate that might be quite different to the one in which they normally live. So somebody who is infirm or cannot make the pilgrimage because of their health, they are exempt. And wealth, because not only must one be able to afford to go on the Hajj and come back again, one must be out of debt and one must also be able to keep one's family and discharge one's responsibilities when one is away on Hajj. So for a lot of people this means that they won't be able ever in their lives to make the Hajj because the journey would just be too expensive for them or because their health is not up to it. In the five days of Hajj, the first day is marked out by two rites. First of all, people wearing their ihram go into the sacred mosque surrounding the Kaaba and then they go around and around the Kaaba seven times, circling it, singing the praises of God. This is the Tawaf, 
just like Abraham and Ishmael did. After the Tawaf, they then go to the two small hills, Al Safa and Al Mawa, just as Hagar did. And they walk and jog backwards and forwards between the two hills, remembering the way that Hagar sought the mercy and providence of God in her search for water. After they have done that, then they may drink from the water of Zamzam, and people take buckets of it, can containers of it home, so that they can give it to their family and friends. Now this part of the Hajj can be made earlier, so that people who arrive in Mecca sometime earlier can do these first two rites and then join with the rest of the pilgrims on day two. It's also possible to visit Mecca at other times of the year and then these two rites alone are performed and this is called the minor pilgrimage or Umrah. The second day of Hajj is a day that sees everybody assembled together on a large open piece of ground called the Plain of Arafat, about 12 kilometers distant from Mecca itself. By tradition, it was on the Plain of Arafat that Adam and Eve were reconciled to God after they were cast out from the garden. In the middle of the plain of Arafat, there stands a small hill which is called the Mount of Mercy. This is where Prophet Muhammad preached his farewell sermon on the one and only Hajj that he made shortly before he died. This is the place of forgiveness, the, the place in which people stand before God through the long afternoon asking for God's forgiveness, confessing their sins, resolving to live a better life in future. What they are doing is anticipating the day of judgment. Now the ikram that men are wearing will actually become their burial shroud. So you can see the intensity of this moment because people are standing before God as they will stand on the day of judgment, confessing their sins, seeking God's forgiveness. Now we need to look a little bit at forgiveness in the Islamic tradition. And we need to look at it from two sides. First of all, from God's perspective, and secondly, from the human perspective. From God's perspective, we have two sayings that God gave to Muhammad to recount and relate to people so that we would know the mind of God on this question. One saying is, my mercy will overcome my wrath. And the second saying is, if you come to me with sins so high they almost reach to the skies, but with repentance in your heart, seeking forgiveness, you will find it. Now from these two sayings then, we know that God has already decided God is by nature merciful. God will forgive the sins of the repentant sinner. So God is not deciding, shall I or won't I, will I? No, God has decided, if you come to me seeking forgiveness with repentance in your heart, you will find it. Therefore, the only thing that can stop that mercy reaching the individual is me myself. Therefore, we need to look at forgiveness from the human perspective. 
Islamic law divides sins into two categories. There are those sins which are only between me and God, which damage my relationship with God, and then there are some sins that involve other people as well. So, for example, everyone is required to pray five times every day. If one fails one in, to make one of those prayers, then that is an offence before God to which one is accountable on the day of judgment. But it's a direct part of the relationship between me and God. In the same way, if I take substances of some sort that damage my health, I am damaging myself and I am accountable for that to God. If, on the other hand, I steal something from somebody else, that is a sin not only against God, but also against my fellow human being. And Islam says, do not be coming to God expecting God to forgive you if you are not willing to put things right with the person that you have offended. So in the months before pilgrims go on Hajj, they are seeking out friends and associates and family members and seeking to put right any disputes, any misunderstandings, any offences that have been given, so that when they go on Hajj, they stand with a clear conscience before God, knowing that they have put things right with human beings that they have offended. In order for a human being to access the mercy of God, four things are necessary. First of all, I must acknowledge my sin. It was wrong, I did it, nobody else is responsible. Secondly, stop it. If you earn your living by exploiting other human beings, don't expect God to forgive you if you're going to carry on exploiting human beings. Three, avoid the circumstances that led you into that sin. Working for that business, they often ask me to do things that I know in my conscience aren't right. Well, then change your job. And four, make restitution. Obviously, if you've stolen something, give it back. But if your sinful act has brought about injury and suffering to other people, then it may be necessary that you pay compensation or that you make up to the rest of society in some way through charitable, voluntary works for the harm that you have caused. Here we see a crucially important part in understanding Islam. Who knows if I have done these things or not? Only me and God. There is a direct relationship between God and each individual believer. There's no priesthood, no sacraments. There's nobody to say, your sins are forgiven. This is between me and God. And so Islam is a direct relationship between the individual believer and God. There are no intermediaries through which one must go. After the day of Arafat, people go a short journey back toward Mecca and then they sleep there that night in the open. They collect small stones because the next rite of the pilgrimage is to reenact the rejection of the temptations of the devil. Tradition has it that when Abraham and Ishmael were going out to make the sacrifice, the devil tempted them to rebel against God's command to disobey. And this took place on three occasions. And so there are, in a place called Mina, three stone pillars that commemorate this temptation of the devil upon Abraham and Ishmael. And so the pilgrims gather up their stones and then they go to stone the pillar and they throw the stones at the pillar, rejecting the temptations of Satan 
and resolving to live a life in defiance of those temptations in the future. Day three of the Hajj is also the festival of sacrifice, Eid al-Adha. The festival of sacrifice commemorates the sacrifice of Abraham and Ismail. It is the only part of the Hajj rite which is performed by all Muslims everywhere around the world. It is regarded as the most important festival of the year for all Muslims. And so the normal festival practice takes place around the world. People will put on clean clothes, they have a shower, they go to prayers, either in the mosque or in huge assemblies in the open air, and then an animal is sacrificed and the meat will be divided between those who are going to eat together, family and friends and neighbours, and those who are poor. Some people who live in countries in which there is no shortage of food will pay for an animal to be sacrificed in another country in their name. So then the whole of that sacrificial animal can be given to the poor and needy there to feed them and relieve their hunger. For those who are on the Hajj itself, animals are slaughtered in slaughterhouses which have been set up there under hygienic conditions with skilled slaughtermen to do the work so that some of the meat will be canned to be sent away to the poor at a later date, some will be frozen and some will be eaten by the pilgrims themselves. People will sacrifice either a sheep or a goat or perhaps a camel if it's a large group of people. Okay. The fourth and fifth days of the Hajj comprise returning again to stone the pillars and making a tawaf of the Kaaba in Mecca. After this, people can then clip their hair and they can change into their ordinary clothes. For most Muslims who go to make the Hajj, this will be a once-in-a-lifetime journey. They will never be able to afford to come back again. There are some people who do come back again and again, perhaps a few times in their lives, in order to relive this experience of closeness to God. After the rites of the Hajj in Mecca itself, pilgrims then go on to Medina, the place where the Prophet is buried, and they then make a visitation of the grave of the Prophet in Medina. They give him their greetings, and they pray to God in that place, asking the Prophet to join his prayers with theirs. Many Muslim groups will observe the practice of staying there for eight days and praying each of the five daily prayers that occur on those eight days in the Prophet's mosque itself. And in this way, calling upon the Prophet to be an intercessor for them on the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment is a crucial feature of the Hajj pilgrimage itself, because from Adam and Eve up until the end of time and the Day of Judgment itself, the whole of humanity is bound together in this one rite. Quite a few of the pilgrims will traditionally then have gone on to make other visitations of holy places on their way home, to Jerusalem and to Hebron, the places associated with Abraham and with the biblical tradition of prophets. Some will then also have gone on to Damascus or to Iraq to make visitation there of the holy places 
And so in this way, they complete the spirit of the once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage. You can catch up with other episodes from this second series of Understanding Islam by going to the Ahlal Bayt TV website and accessing them on the On Demand section. You can also find there the whole of Series 1. And if you go to my own website, you can find the accompanying articles that go with each episode. Join me next week when we're going to look at the visitation of holy places in Islam. I look forward to seeing you then.